1917 was an awful year. All the divisions of the world and all its conflicts seemed to be resolved into one conflict and one division. The conflict was the war. The division was between those who were truly in it and those who were not. It was a world war now. No continent was spared. Few countries of any stature were able to stand aside. Japan was in, America was in, Bulgaria was in, Romania was in, Greece was in, Portugal was in, Bolivia was in. Russia was going out. By now, whatever men might wish or plan, whether they believed in it or whether they did not, one front had inexorably become the center, the very heart of the war, the Western Front. 470 miles long, the great battles of four years had created on either side of the trench lines a deep zone of military endeavor, a hideous, ravaged wilderness, the zone of the armies. This zone was a place apart, a separate region, a landscape of madness. Scenes which four years of modern war had created within it could never be imagined by those outside. Only the artist's eye could fathom what man had inflicted upon himself in this zone. separateness was absolute. You could almost draw a line where it began. For one war artist, Sir William Orpin, just beyond a valley between Amiens and Albert, suddenly one felt oneself in another world. For 
Wyndham Lewis, it began just past the line of guns. At this point, civilization ended. From here onwards, said Lewis, there was only shell-pitted nothingness, an arid and blistering vacuum. The artist filled this vacuum, each in his own way, with a frieze of tragic and heroic figures. Never the lost and tiny soldiers and their weapons amid the desolate expanse. Each one differently depicted the terrible footprint of man. Paul Nash turned his brush and pencil into weapons to assail the cruelty of war. Other war artists only saw an explosion, but the explosion took place inside Nash. Paul Nash revealed the earth herself exploded. And with wonder, at particular times, in particular places, each artist observed the extraordinary beauty of this man-made desert. Nash wrote to his wife in March 1917, Here in the back garden of the trenches, it is amazingly beautiful. The mud is dried to a pinky color. And upon the parapet, and through the sandbags even, the green grass pushes up and waves in the breeze, while dots of bright dandelion, clover, thistles and 20 other plants flourish luxuriously, brilliant growth of bright green against the pink earth. Orpen revisited the year-old battlefields of the Somme. Now, in the summer of 1917, no words could express the beauty of it. The dreary, dismal mud was baked white and pure, dazzling white. White daisies, red poppies and a blue flower, great masses of them stretched for miles and miles. The sky, a pure dark blue, and the whole air up to a height of about 40 feet, thick with white butterflies. Everything shimmered in the heat. Clothes, guns, all that had been left in confusion when the war passed on had now been baked by the sun into one wonderful combination of color. White, pale gray, and pale gold. Amid this macabre beauty and unspeakable ugliness, the ant-like armies in their millions came to terms with the war's afflictions. On the Western Front, a continuous accompaniment of sound diseased their nerves.
after the Germans had stopped shelling a little while, we heard one of their big ones coming over. And normally, within reason, you could tell if one was going to land anywhere near or not. If it was, the normal procedure was to throw yourself down and avoid the shell fragments. This one, we knew, was going to drop near. My pal shouted and threw himself down. I was too damn tired even to fall down. I stood there. Next, I had a terrific pain in the back and the chest, and I found myself face downwards in the mud. In this permanent zone of destruction, where war seemed to be a fixture from time immemorial, stretching forward to invisible duration, sound was always there. The smell was always there. The familiar trench smell of 1915 to 17 haunts my nostrils, compounded of stagnant mud, latrine buckets, chloride of lime, unburied or half-buried corpses, rotting sandbags, stale human sweat, fumes of cordite or lidite. Sometimes it was sweetened by cigarette smoke and the scent of bacon frying over wood fires, broken ammunition boxes. Sometimes made sinister by the lingering odor of poison gas. Within this unquiet zone, sharing its squalors and such compensations as it had, dwelt a population apart. The armies of Germany, France, the British Empire and Belgium. And when the infantry looked upwards, admiringly, hopefully or fearfully, they saw, dotted against the white clouds or the blue sky, the airmen, counted in thousands now, yet still able to preserve in this vast, anonymous war individual identities which the muddied infantry might envy. In the sky, they fought a war of champions. The names of the aces rang through every country. Guinemer, Franck, Nergesser, Ball, McCudden, Manock, Bölker, Immelmann, Richthofen. Looking down from their swaying cockpits, the flyers saw below them, as no one else could see, unfolding mile beyond mile, the incredible pockmarked devastation of the Western Front, the world within a world. Down there on the ground, men had few intimates. Beyond the narrow horizon through a periscope, or bordered by the traverse of a trench or the lip of a crater, there was someone else whom one had learned to know, better perhaps than one knew one's own people. Sometimes as little as 20 yards away, sometimes as much as half a mile, he was always there, living exactly as one lived oneself, the frontline enemy. I never had any feelings towards any personal enemy. For me and also for the, most of the boys, it was the enemy. Whether it was a British or a French, we didn't mind. And I think that the British thought in the same way. As soon as we made prisoners, the feeling of enemy was gone. Then we took care of them, we looked after them, we asked them if they were thirsty. Most of them were very thirsty, because warfare makes thirsty. You are very much excited. You perspire, you are afraid. Everybody is shivering. The nerve strain is a terrible one. But never one forgets what each man on both sides has to undergo. 
The enemy was Jerry or Old Fritz. There were frontline soldiers who spoke openly of German comrades. Even the French had learned to use the word Bosch in a half friendly way. For Frenchmen fighting on their own soil and always on the same worn out, blood soaked stretches of their soil, a sense of separateness came with a peculiar shock. They realized that they were slowly becoming strangers in their own land. The army came to be looked on as a kind of exile from the life of the nation. The military world had no connections with the life of the country. Two universes were juxtaposed, the one civilian, the other uniformed, and they knew nothing and would continue to know nothing of each other. If you were to ask me who it is we despise and hate the most, my answer would be, first of all, the war profiteers, businessmen of all kinds, and with them, the professional patriots, the humbugs, the literary gents who dine each day in pyjamas and red leather slippers off a dish of bosch. Every army was learning to hate the literary gents. A German soldier wrote, according to the newspapers, the French were a crowd of degenerates, the English a cowardly lot of shopkeepers, the Russians swine. This mania for disparaging, abusing and calumniating the enemy was so disgusting that I sent a paragraph to an editor. But he returned it with a letter that made me despair. One had to bear in mind public opinion, he said. And thus was that public opinion bred which the men at the front came in time to spit upon. The jargon of war on the home front was very different from the language of the fighting men. A British gunner officer received a book of verse one day. The writer had served in his battery. About your book, I've read it carefully, and candidly, I don't think much of it. The piece about the horses isn't bad, but all the rest, excuse the word, is tripe. The same old tripe we've read a thousand times. My grief, but we're fed up to the back teeth with war books, war verse, all the eyewash stuff that seems to please the idiots at home. And what's the good of war books if they fail to give civilian readers an idea of what life is like in the firing line? You might have done that much. From you at least, I thought we'd get an inkling of the truth. But no, you rant, rattle, beat your drum and blow your tuppenny trumpet like the rest. Red battle's glory, honor's utmost task, gay jesting faces of undaunted boys. The same old boy's own paper balderdash. Hang it, you can't have clean forgotten things you went to bed with, woke with, smelt and felt. All those long months of boredom streaked with fear, mud, cold, fatigue, sweat, nerve strain, sleeplessness and men's excreta viscid in the rain, and stiff-legged horses lying by the road, their bloated bellies shimmering green with flies. The images of war could never fade from the minds of those who knew them, and could scarcely be conceived in the minds of those who didn't. Arriving home on leaf, I went to my aunt's house and uh, I found that people wanted to take me out to dinners and theatres and uh, didn't seem to want to know much about what we were doing out on the front. But I did explain to them that the conditions were really terrible and that the food also was bad but uh, they didn't want to know at all. When you stepped off the leave train at Victoria, of course, the first effect was just that here you were home for the holidays. But um, very soon, uh, that began to wear off. And at any rate, um, from 1917 onwards, um, one felt that there was something unreal about leave. I'm bound to say that I got myself into a state of mind where it was the trenches that was the real world and it was London and my family uh, that was unreal. It was a Frenchman who summed up for all the fighting men exiled in the zone of the armies. When we get back and tell our story, 
It's we who will be wrong. It was impossible for the soldiers to communicate the truth about this war because nothing like it had ever happened before. Never had such vast armies, wielding such an immense apparatus of killing and destruction, battled and clawed each other for so long in one place. Flesh and blood and nerves could only stand so much. Well, I suppose there's a limit to everything, but what with the mud of the Somme and the mud of Passchendaele, to see men keep on sinking into the slime, dying in the slime, I think it absolutely finished me off because I knew for three months before I was wounded that I was going to get it. And there, were, there was one time when this ammunition wagons were coming up and I'd been in this mud, mud right up to my waist, and I thought, well, this is it. I'll put my leg under the wagon. And I get, did, I got as close to that wagon as possible, and I just couldn't do it. But I, I think I was broken in spirit and mind. By the end of 1917, every army had shown the effects of this unremitted strain, eating away morale. Newcomers might still be eager, still imbued with the enthusiasm of earlier years. They were startled at what they found. You see, when I joined up, I was dead scared I wouldn't get out to France before it was over. I thought it would be over before I get there. And when I got there, when I got into the line, I remember writing back home saying, the heart's been blown out of these people. This was now almost entirely a citizen army, a vast force approaching five millions, nearly two millions of them on the Western Front. In all the time that this army remained in the field, there were 304,000 trials by court-martial. 3,080 death sentences were passed. 346 were carried out. He stood tied to a post against a wall and he was in civilian clothes and there was a little white piece of paper pinned over his heart and he had to fire at that. We did not know what our rifles were loaded with. Some were loaded with ball, others with blank. We then had the order to fire and pull the trigger. One knew by the recoil if it was loaded with ball or not. Then 